What's up guys, welcome back to another GGF mod build video. And today I'll be going through my recent build, which I called the Gentleman's Build. But before that, this video was brought to you by ASRock and the Z590 OC Formula. Collaborated with professional overclocker Nick Shee, the Z590 OC Formula is designed and built with no compromises. Featuring a 16 phase design with 90 amp SPS, 12 layer PCB and SMD dim slots, help with memory signal margin for better overclocking. OC buttons for dialing in those exact frequencies at the precise time and an OLED screen for displaying important real-time stats. Learn more in the link below. Now, the reason why I went down that route of calling it that name, I actually didn't have that name planned for this build. It was just that during the process and towards the end, I was kind of thinking how smart this build was looking. It was looking very grown up. It had kind of uh, mature colors like the black. I'm not saying that black is mature, but it didn't have any crazy standout features or any RGB or crazy colors. It had this nice rose gold around the edge, which I added, and it just looked very clean. So it was kind of like a last minute decision, and I think it kind of went okay. I just did have uh, one or two people talk about, oh, it had green glowing uh, RGB. To me, a static color, I don't think is class as RGB. I went with green because I don't really do many green uh, looking builds. And I think the green just worked well with this rose gold. Like I could have gone with any color. I did try white RGB or white lighting at first and it just washed out some of the other components. So I thought I'd go with something completely different. I'll go with green. And the reason why I do have the lights on is I just wanted to show you guys what it did look like with having some lights on. Like I could have had everything off, but then it just would have looked like at the start of the video, instead of having the part where it was, where it was off, so you can see the white coolant and then it transitioned into the system being on and you can see all the different areas that light up. Now I wanna cover a bit about the case. Now this is the Johnsbo i100 Pro. Now this is a relatively new, I wouldn't say new company, but they're a part of uh, Johnsbo, so it's called Johns Plus. I'm not sure where they came up with that name, but um, I'll throw a link for this chassis if you want to check it out. I have used Johnsbo before. They have some pretty crazy uh, cases, uh, crazy sort of looking ones, probably not for everyone's taste, but the Johns Plus series are more toned down. They're more elegant. They got this one here, and there are a few interesting features which I'll cover with this one. And then they have a few others as well. They're actually sending me two more chassis. Uh, they're quite small, and they have this same type of concept. Now, the thing that's interesting about this case, it is sort of a traditional ITX chassis, and it's more like those SFF cases where you've got dual-sided setup. So you've got your motherboard, power supply, CPU on one side, and on the other side, which you can see here, you have a vertical mount GPU and so on. Now, this is a little bit different what I've done in this build. Uh, don't take it that this is how the chassis comes. I'll go through uh, what I did to this case to make it look like this. So the case does come with your standard PSU on the other side with your motherboard and then your GPU over here. And the interesting thing with this chassis is, one, it can take a 360 all-in-one cooler up the top. A lot of ITX chassis are limited to 240. So this will take a full uh, 360 radiator at the top, which I've got APE, a 45 millimeter thick radiator from EK, which is quite thick, especially in an ITX chassis. But the interesting thing is the whole back panel is removable on this chassis. And I'll throw out some shots of this. So you can have this orientation here where you've got your GPU on this side and your motherboard on the other side, which I've said about a hundred times already. But it comes with another back panel. You unscrew this one, put the other back panel in, and it rotates the GPU back to horizontal, and then it pushes the motherboard all the way back onto this side. So then you have your traditional layout with your motherboard uh, upright, your GPU horizontally, which is plugged directly into, into the motherboard. You don't need the riser cable. And then the power supply goes off to the end of the motherboard. So the power supply stays in the same configuration, uh, same setup for both configurations. It's just the mother motherboard and GPU change. I was a bit skeptical on which route to go down. I went with this route with um, each side being different only because I wanted to showcase this GPU and I wanted to showcase this really nice EK uh, FE block as well. And another interesting fact on this chassis is it can take a full size power supply. I have gone down with the SFF route, or SFX route for the power supply only because I didn't want it taking up a lot of room. I wanted it quite, uh, quite slim line and out of the way. Whereas if I put an ATX in here, it would have affected the overall look of the build. And another area I really like on this chassis, which I'm pretty sure it is designed for a mechanical hard drive, at the very front of the chassis, you pull this cover off and then there's a bit of a, a bit of a uh, gap, like a bit of compartment. Uh, you're meant to put like a 
three and a half inch mechanical drive. It may get a little bit toasty in there, but I ended up using that for all my cable storage. So when I mean cable storage, I actually flip my power supply around so all the cables come out towards the front and the actual bulk of the cables are in there. And then I've just got the right lengths that come out to what I need. And I've also got a heap of other cable bulk in there as well. But bear in mind, I did have to shorten a lot of cables. All the fan cables are all cut down to the exact right length. Had to extend the ATX power that comes in from the back. So it runs along, goes in that little uh, compartment, comes out here and feeds into the power supply. So pretty much every cable needed to be either lengthened or shortened, mainly because I was limited to space in here. I'll show you a shot of this front cover up. It's not pretty, but I just had to fit as many cables in there as possible. And I actually even fit an RGB module inside here because um, a lot of RGB modules don't control brightness. And when you're filming a lot of these builds, uh, it's really handy to have brightness control on your RGB. Uh, motherboards can, but I already ran a few off the motherboard and a lot, a lot of other controllers just do the different modes and the color and that's it. So having brightness, if you dim it all down, it looks much better on uh, film. So that's a tip for you guys. If you do want to get some good looking RGB or just different color lights, you just need to turn that brightness down. All right, now moving on to the original plan for this chassis. I did have a plan to go with a 120 FLT and that was going to go in the front compartment here. I'll turn it around so you can see. So that was going in the front compartment over here at the front and I was gonna have the tubes running into it. So I actually ended up cutting a new cover panel for it. I had everything ready to go. I had the FLT mounted in this front section here. I had a square cut out for the pump. And then I actually thought, well, there's a lot of space that is left over in this build, a lot of wasted space. So in the end, I decided to scrap that idea. And then I just went with a whopping 360 FLT in the side. And yes, the side panel does go back on. It all fits in here. All I had to do was add, actually, I got away with using this hole that was already here and then this hole already here. Because what I did in this chassis to get all this room, I actually gutted out all the internal frame. So I got rid of the structure that held the power supply in, in place. I got rid of a few other bars because there was a bar up here, a bar here, a lot of uh, bars for the power supply. So all I had left was the floating motherboard tray. I actually did cut that down a little bit because it was a little bit too big. And I wanted the idea or the look that the motherboard and the GPU were just floating. And that's kind of how it ended up looking. So yeah, I had everything ready to go on the front. So then I changed the idea to put the FLT on this side here. And then I just added a square cover panel because I had already cut out a hole in that area for the 120 FLT for the DDC. So I scrapped that, ended up going this. This was very last minute. And then I managed to route two tubes into this front panel. And I think this looked much, much cleaner. Taking a look at some of the other mods I did, the paint used was a Dulux bright finish. I'm pretty sure it's a rose gold. Going by the lid, it does look very, very rose gold. And I added that on the feet. I added that on all the collars. I decided not to do all the, all the fittings. So things like 90s, uh, the base of the hard tube fittings and other areas. I just wanted to do the collars just to give that little bit of touch of that rose gold. Some other areas I did, which you can probably see, I'm not sure how well, I did all the edging on the panel. So all along here, uh, the top, the front side here, this side here, all the top side here. So the way I did that is I actually painted the front panel and the back panel black because I was sent the silver chassis and I really wanted to do this black theme. And I think this rose gold worked much better with black than it would have silver. So I painted those black first. And then what I did, I don't really have any footage of this, is I just taped all the, uh, all the flat sides around and then I just had the edges showing and then I just lightly sprayed all along and then I just pulled the tape off and that's how you can get that nice edge. Another way you can do it, which I couldn't actually find the right color I needed because I already had the spray paint, is you can use paint pens. I've used these in the, in the past. These work really, really good. I don't actually don't want to pull it off. It'll probably go everywhere. So you can get these in different tip thicknesses. This one's like a round one. If you get one that's flat, kind of like a, a paintbrush, but they're really hard, you can simply just run it up along the edge and they work really good. I actually had the top already done on a paint pen. It was like a copper color, but it didn't quite look right. So that's how the top looked. I actually did, did that myself. So I came up with my own idea is I just sprayed a lot of the uh, paint, which was the right color I had in sort of a cardboard box. And then I just got different, uh, 
different uh, textures of foam and then I just tried to make my own paint pen by dipping it into the paint and then just running it along and then eventually I did get the right uh, type of foam I needed. It needed to be quite uh, quite coarse and quite uh, quite firm because if it was too squishy it just went all down the sides and it didn't look very good at all. So yeah you can make up your own paint pens if you don't have the right colour you need and that is a handy little tip. So I just wanted to match in the top as well with those lines but yeah pretty much uh, painted uh, the edges, the fittings, the feet and then also the Antec Katana memory. Now the reason why I left the Katana memory RGB lighting off is I only gave it a light paint. I didn't want to painted too much because I wanted to see how the light went through when it was on but because I painted it lightly it was kind of when you backlit it you could see imperfections and it wasn't a solid light light it was kind of dotted transparent so I left it off just to keep it nice and uh, in line with the rest of the theme uh, so it's pretty much on the painting didn't do too much on that just those uh, main areas on the ro rose gold and then just the front panel and then the back panel and then also the motherboard tray I repainted because once I cut that down it got a bit scratched and all that so I cleaned that up. Uh, another thing I did add was the something that cleaned it up really nicely was the 3090 riser cable which is down here. I did add a nice little cover over that because once that's off you probably saw it in the time that's built and for you guys who haven't seen the time that's built I'll throw that in the description as well for you to check out. So just having the bare cable and then you got the 16 by connector and depending on what cable you get uh, whether it's like white or black or brown they do have a, a bit of a rubber strip that doesn't look good. So I just grabbed a bit, bit of aluminum and I actually just traced around a, a cable grommet. I'm pretty sure that shape is from like an 11 XL, 11 Mini, one of the L11s, just traced around it and that gave me my shape because I just held that up to the bottom and I thought well that covers it pretty nice. So I used that as my template and then just stuck that on and it does neat neaten it up nicely and I could have put a logo or some text or something on there um, to sort of take it a little bit further. And some other things I just noticed I did do, I did do the EK badges as well. Whenever I'm theming a build I normally rip those off uh, the good guys at EK do send me a heap of just the uh, stock badges so I can uh, re-add them so you just pull them off. I would recommend not using something like a heat gun if you are going to pull, pull it off because so if you're going to heat gun something on acrylic, uh, heat something on a C tool, if it's on nickel it's not too bad. You can use a hair dryer but I just don't think it will get hot enough because these badges are stuck on so so tight. Pretty much you're going to pull, pull it off, you're going to damage the badge so make sure you have a spare one. I normally don't bother heating up any of the surface because I don't want to add any defects. I simply just get like a really fine uh, flat blade screwdriver, just get under it and rip it off. It is going to leave a big divot in the badge but you can throw that away and as long as you have a spare one you're good to go. And then I normally add just a, the colour vinyl or something I have that I'm theming the rest of the build. So on this one I just sprayed some of the vinyl rose gold because I couldn't get any rose gold vinyl that I was after. So then I sprayed it, painted that the same colour, put a little circle on first and then painted the badge black and then put that back on and then that gives me that same type of uh, theme all around, all, all around the whole build because having a silver badge there, silver badge on the CPU block just would have stood out I think and it wouldn't have matched too good. Um, I've spoken about reversing the power supply, I think that was a sort of a huge factor in the build because if you could imagine having all the cables coming out here and the fact I didn't have the right lengths for this build, I didn't order any custom cables uh, for this case because originally I was just going to do an all-in-one, I was going to review this chassis and I was just going to do an all-in-one at the top and then I just progressed further and further and further into doing this custom build. So it was kind of last minute that I had to come up with a way that I could hide most of the cables because I just didn't have the right length. Now mounting the 360 FLT I already mentioned up the top, that was pretty simple. It actually does fit in there quite nicely. I've been moving this around so many times. It does fit in there quite nicely up the top. It just had to be angled in and then I just had to make these holes a little bit bigger to uh, take the countersunk screw heads. And then the in the outer up here and it was a bit of a mission because I do have some 90s, some 45s that then feed into this front chamber and then they are connected in there. And then one comes out here and then one comes out uh, here for the, or one goes in and then one goes out for the GPU. So that's pretty much that, um, how that went. 
And I think that worked out pretty good. And once that's lit up, it does look very, very nice. And I didn't use Mr. Mystic Fog Coolant, I just used standard EK Solid White. Now moving on to some of the temps on the system, a lot of people wanted to know, is this going to be enough for a 3090 and the uh, 5800X? Now the reason I went with the 5800X was, one reason was temps, I wanted to keep it keep it down a bit, and I didn't want to add something like a 5950X and a 3090, which a lot of guys are doing these days on YouTube. Uh, they're pairing like i9s with 3080s, 3090s, in SFF cases with a 240 Slim Rad, and most of them are saying, hey, temps are fine, this is good to go. Now, from my personal experiences, that's really not going to work very well. Um, when I checked out the Meshlicious build, I only did a CPU loop because I didn't want to throw the 3090 in a loop with a 240mm radiator. I do have a build coming up behind me in a, in a Ghost S1. Now, I do have dual top hats. So I got a top hat, a bottom hat, and I will be doing two 240 radiators, and I'll be putting a 3090 and a probably a 5900X, but each of those will have their own 240mm rad, so that should be pretty interesting, that build. So with this build, I went with the uh, 360PE for the 3090, and then I'd sort of toned down the CPU a bit to a 5800X, which is still a very, very decent CPU, especially for gaming. Now, taking a look at the temps when I bring it up, all right, so don't really need to know. The motherboard was an ASRock B550 um, Phantom Gaming RTX. I did have PBO on the 5800X. That does boost it a little bit further, especially the all core as well. It does boost it a bit further, and it was 32 gigs of Katana memory. Um, starting the top, I'll go down. Assassin's Creed uh, for the 3090. I've got three temperatures here. It's the same for all of the uh, all of the temperature results. So we've got the RTX 3090 FE is just the stock standard GPU temperature. Then we've got HS, which is the hotspot. And then we've got memory, which is the memory temp. And then we have the 5800X, the, which is the PBO temp for that one. And that'll stay the same for each of the games or benchmarks tested. So starting off with Assassin's Creed, the 3090 FE ran at 45.3 degrees. And the hotspot ran at about 56.5. So normally, when your GPU is running about 40 to 50, your hotspot is going to be about 10 degrees more, and then it will slowly get uh, further apart the higher you go. Then for the memory, we were looking at 64 degrees, and then the 5800X for PBO was 59.4. So all around, those temperatures were very, very decent for that. For Cinebench R20 for a 20 minute run, I, I just left the GPU temperatures in here just to keep the, the graph all even throughout, but you really don't need to worry about the GPU temps when you're benchmarking or doing the, the Cinebench because it's purely CPU. But we can see the 3090 was basically at just water temp. You're looking at 26 there for the GPU. Hotspot was 38 and then the memory was 38. So GPU was doing absolutely nothing. And then the CPU was at 69.4. Once again, those temperatures are still really good. Bear in mind you, the room temperature was a little bit chilly here. It was 19 degrees. Uh, didn't need any air con or, or anything here. Uh, Far Cry New Dawn, so this sort of does does hit the CPU a bit and also the GPU. So the 3090 FE was at 41.3. Hotspot on the GPU was 52.3. Once again, that 10 degrees difference. And then the memory was 58. And the uh, 5800X was 65.3. And moving on at uh, A to 64, this is FPU, 20 minute run. Once again, I just left the GPU uh, temps just to keep the graph all even. 3090 FE was at 25.8, 39.5 for the hotspot, and then 36 on the memory. So pretty much the same as what the Cinebench R20 was. And then for the CPU, this was the hottest at 73.5, and this does draw the most wattage out of the 5800X. And moving on to 2D Mark Time Spy, this was on a 20 minute loop. We're looking at uh, 46.4 for the 3090, hotspot was 57.3, and then the memory on the 3090 was 58.8, and then looking at the 5800X, it was at 67.5. So overall, I was very, very impressed with these results. I myself thought they would have been a little bit warmer than that, but I guess if you're used to building ITX chassis or is even SFF cases, which I've done in the past and I'll be doing uh, in the Ghost S1 is most of the time you don't really have room for a reservoir. Um, and then if you do, it's gonna be really small. Now, everyone knows that adding multiple reservoirs to a system doesn't really help your water temperature cool down, but I think having something like this size in a chassis like this, compared with, um, paired with the 360 radiator, which is 45 millimeters thick, 
it did have a lot of thermal room to play with. It wasn't just a slim 240 and no reservoir at all. So when you don't have a reservoir in a system, the coolant can heat up pretty quick and then you're relying everything on the radiator to do the work. So overall, I was impressed with the temperatures on this system. Um, and I think that's pretty much it on this video. Um, if you haven't seen the time that's built for this, once again, I'll throw it in the description as well. But um, yeah, I am pretty impressed with this uh, case from John's Plus. I don't have a price on this yet. If I do, I'll throw it in the uh, description for the parts used on this case. I'll throw it in there, an Amazon link, so you can check it out. If not, I'll just put a link to where this is on their website, so you can find out some more information on it. And I do have two more of these chassis coming from John's Plus. I think there's a slightly, uh, slightly taller one, not as long, and then there's some weird triangle one or something coming as well, so it'll be pretty cool to check out those. But once again, I do want to thank John's for sending this out for me to check out. I want to thank you guys for watching, and see you next time.